Indians did all our little bits or tried to do them and he kept us at doing them. The challenge was to find a wing shape which could fly supersonically and also provide the stability needed at lower speeds. Mathematical calculations led Cushman to the slender delta wing shape. Cushman and Maskell were looking seriously at a lot of experiments done on slender wings. Uh, the first, just rectangular wings, which had the bad flow, but also the type of delta wings. And then the Cushman got the very good idea and thought, can't we get controlled flow with these kind of wings? That was the essential thing. First, to have stable, reliable, what he called healthy flows. Cushman's breakthrough was the discovery of these healthy air flows caused by the slender delta shape. In flight, air is disturbed by the front edge of the wings and forms circular swirls above them. This provided the extra lift and stability needed to cope with the slower speeds of landing and takeoff. It was William Gray, a former fighter pilot also working at Farnborough, who demonstrated that Cushman's calculations would work in practice. He was assisted by a young aerodynamicist, Dr. Jean Ross. There had been some work done in America on models similar to this in a wind tunnel which showed that in fact they became uncontrollable laterally. You would get an oscillation that built up. And what Gray did was to fly models which had got the right sort of weight distribution and he would fly them. He would throw them off the top of tall buildings, off the top of the control tower and then also worked in the 24-foot tunnel here and showing them that you could fly at the sort of angles of attack that one needed to land safely. My involvement in the test was mainly as um, a sort of ball girl to go and pick the models up when he'd thrown it from somewhere. Uh, there was a team of us who took it in turns to do that. We'd got younger legs than he had. But also we were, I was in a team that was working to sort out the mathematical theories. It didn't have the electronic computing machine, so we had a large offices full of women doing computing exercises. Cushman's maths and Gray's models helped to convince the Supersonic Transport Advisory Committee of the shape the plane should take. The committee was led by Morian Morgan. In the course of our work, this, this sort of shape was evolved as the most likely shape for an aeroplane doing about Mach 2, flying at twice the speed of sound across the Atlantic. It's rather a lovely shape. You really feel if God meant aeroplanes to fly, he meant them to be this shape. The engines capable of powering supersonic flight already existed and had been developed by Bristol Sidley in the mid-1940s. Concorde is powered by four Olympus jet engines, the design of which started way back in 1946. They were originally used in the Avril Vulcan jet bomber, which was Britain's main deterrent for many years, and then they were subsequently adapted for power generation, electrical power generation, and for naval ship propulsion. There had to be some big changes to the engine to make it suitable for Concorde. Although the thrust of the engine had been increased by a factor of two from the start of the program, it had to be increased again for Concorde, so we finished up with almost four times the original design power. But the British were not alone. At the 1961 Paris Air Show, the French revealed a model of their version of a supersonic passenger aircraft, the Super Caravelle. With remarkably similar designs, the two nations decided to join forces. In 1962, the French and British governments signed a treaty to build a plain, newly christened Concorde. Four companies, two in Britain and two in France, undertook the production work. It was left to the engineers on the ground in Bristol and Toulouse to make such a complex joint project work in practice. What we had to do first before starting the development was to agree what everybody would do. And after a long discussion, uh, uh, the agreement was that the British would do the, the front end of the fuselage, the rear end of the fuselage and the rudder, plus the engine installation. 
uh, the French would do the rest, that is to say the wing, the centre fuselage and the landing gear. In practice, particularly on the design side, there was a lot of interchange of work and collaboration and in many areas we both worked on the same part of the aeroplane, in fact to get the best overall result for the project. This is a so integrated aircraft that everybody would have to know what the other was doing to make them fit together. Alors, où est-ce qu'il travaille en ce moment, Monsieur McDonald? Il travaille euh, dans les ateliers. Dans les ateliers, n'est-ce pas? Dans les ateliers. Ceci est une fenêtre carrée. This is a rectangular a window a square. No, this Understanding each other was really quite straightforward. We found it was easiest if we each spoke in our own language and we found we understood the other guy really quite well. Dans cette position, sur, la, sur le côté, là, dans cette bossette. So you propose, therefore, that the bootstrap turbine goes forward here. People might think it was difficult to get the parts fit together, you know, French working in millimeters, British in inches, but that wasn't a problem. I mean, physical matching of the parts was not a problem. When we effectively had a glorified Meccano set, parts did in fact go, go together with remarkably little difficulty in the end. In many ways the, the culture was different. I suppose the most obvious one is the length of time we used to spend having lunch in France in the early days of the programme. We had uh, nice parties in France and uh, we were playing Skittles in Bristol and they learned playing pétanque in Toulouse. The plane's skin temperature reaches boiling point when it flies supersonically. So for Concorde, all the materials had to be tested and adapted to cope with extreme heat. By 1965, the tested body parts were beginning to take shape and were put together to form the prototypes. Concorde's future passengers also had to be temperature tested to ensure that the air conditioning system would prevent them from being cooked. And at Farnborough, in a specimen cabin built into an oven, tin men are sitting in for the businessmen of the 70s. And for complete realism, each one is heated to represent a human body. 110 watts for a normal person, 125 for one who's slightly intoxicated. What happens if the Concorde's cooling system fails? Do we all get roasted? No, say the experts. It'll be bearable for 10 minutes, long enough for the aircraft to slow down. Meanwhile, the political temperature was heating up. A Swedish aviation expert, Bo Lundberg, spoke out about the possible dangers of radiation for the supersonic passengers of the future. Life and man has developed on this planet during millions of years under the shield of the atmosphere that has protected us from dangerous cosmic rays. Why then this extreme hurry to put the ticket-paying passengers at the top of this shield before all the dangers are known? Though the dangers of radiation from cosmic rays proved unfounded, the airlines of the day took no chances. Initially, British Airways weren't going to have stewardesses on Concorde because they felt that because of the altitude at which Concorde flies it would make the girls infertile because of the radiation up there and in fact there isn't that much of it at all and it was quite funny because as soon as Concorde came into service there was a baby boom on the fleet and everybody started having babies because of, instead of being away for three weeks at a time everyone was at home for most of the time and only away for a couple of days. Back in the early 1960s, the stratosphere was unknown territory and the prototypes were laden down with equipment to monitor its behaviour. Hundreds are working in the apparent chaos of a long electronic tube. Much of the hundreds of miles of wiring needed in the prototypes is special to test aircraft. In the space set aside for passengers in the production aircraft, there now sit twin rows of black boxes. They are there to record all the data from flight tests. The world caught its first glimpse of Concorde in 1967 as the prototype 001 was rolled out in Toulouse. Brian Calvert, a future Concorde pilot, was among the crowds that day. 
in due course after a little playing by a military band, the uh, hangar doors opened and there was this amazingly beautiful creature sideways onto us, revealed, and uh, a rather theatrical tractor driver came out and uh, got into his cab and towed the aeroplane out in a great arc. The nose of the aeroplane swung over our heads and all the Caledonian girls went, ah, like that, and I thought, I'm going to be a Concorde pilot. Now began one of the longest periods of test flying in aviation history. Shared by Britain and France, the teams were led by test pilots Brian Trubshaw and Andre Tourcat. Well, this is the old 001. We flew for the first time on the March 2, 1969. And this was our office. What about the, the, the TV sets? Well, for the tech thing. Do they need to be here? Because as uh, well, the flight test program of Concorde was obviously too long, more than six years. This was due first to the difficulty of the technical problems to solve. Everything is new here, but also to the conditions of the uh, Franco-British cooperation. The most difficult part. I think of the whole of the flight test program was actually getting the engine intake um, combination, you might say, the t which is called the power plant, to work satisfactorily. There are times when the air going into the engine, you might say, is not digestible. And when it is not digestible, the engine behaves rather like we do when we have something that doesn't, doesn't we can't digest and there is a loud bang. It's like a large belch in many ways. It's, it spits the air out of the engine. It won't take it. Six years on, a whole range of improvements was incorporated into the final design. Big physical modifications have been made and this is mainly to the nose with a windscreen we can look through, which was not uh, exactly the case for the prototypes, and also the rear part of the fuselage, which is longer and uh, nicer, I think. When the design started, nobody knew how to make that visor sliding panel, call it what you like, transparent. So the prototype finished up with a metal visor and a sort of peephole that you could see a little out of. And I always felt that one day it would stick and you wouldn't get it down for landing. And my judgment was that uh, you'd get two for a nice try. But the public attention had become focused on one of Concorde's more spectacular qualities, the sonic boom. Just as a bow wave attaches itself to a boat, so all the while an aircraft is flying supersonically, it creates two shock waves, one from the front and one from the back, which roll across a swathe of countryside miles wide to be heard by everybody underneath as a sort of double bang. Concerned about the effect of the sonic boom, the anti-Concorde project was set up by Richard Wiggs. It was found by measurements that were carried out by experts that the amount of shaking that was caused to cathedrals, houses and various types of buildings was about ten times as much as anything else that happened to them, like great storms and thunder. And bits did fall off St David's Cathedral. Chimney stacks fell down, windows were broken, greenhouses were shattered, and quite a substantial amount of money was paid out in compensation for the damage that was caused. When the aeroplane was being designed, uh, people expected it would be able to fly over land and cities and so on. It became clear to many of us before we went into service and certainly after we went into service that it would never be able to fly anywhere supersonically except over the sea. Concorde's final production cost escalated tenfold to nearly two billion pounds. The rising cost provoked a backlash as the project reached the point of no return. It was pretty precarious anyway, getting Concorde into service. I don't mean technically, but politically, because it made a wonderful opportunity for everybody to take sides, and everybody from the Bishop of Kingston to Mary Goldring, the economist, and hundreds of other people 
all had views about Concord which they made extremely public and it was our job simply to make the thing work and to demonstrate in many cases that it wasn't the evil monster that some of them thought it was going to be. I think for us as cabin crew it was very exciting being one of the first crews on Concord. It was very much a pioneering feeling on the fleet. We felt somehow that life was very hard for Concord. She had a lot of political problems and there were a lot of people against Concord on both sides of the Atlantic and yet it's such a, a masterpiece of technology. It, we felt it was a shame she wasn't getting more support and more encouragement. Across the channel in France, Concorde received a warmer welcome. Politicians like President Pompidou took pride in their association with the plane. The Concorde pilot, Edouard Chamel, recalls the public's response. Les Français ont toujours été très fiers de leur passé aéronautique. La, la France, pendant de nombreuses années, surtout dans la première partie de l'aviation, a été très très active dans le domaine de l'aéronautique. Et donc, pour Concorde, la réception a été bonne. Il y a eu peu d'opposants. Il était à la fois très beau, très très extraordinaire. Et donc, euh, son aventure elle-même a capté le, les gens. Et dans tous les domaines économiques, depuis euh, l'huile végétale, en allant aux montres, les valises, bien sûr, tout ce qui touchait le voyage, c'est la première fois que l'on découvre pour un avion uh, un tel attachement. But other countries proved less enthusiastic. Of the hundreds of Concords optioned by the world's airlines, only Air France and British Airways went ahead, ordering seven each. In January 1976, Concord was finally launched into passenger service. Behind Captain Todd, talking to his co-pilot, Captain Kelvert, was Concord's original test pilot, Brian Trubshaw. Today, his original job done, he was taking a back seat. I was the co-pilot on the first commercial flight from London to Bahrain. We took off in at the same time as the French airplane from uh, Paris. They went off to Dakar and Rio de Janeiro, and we went off to Bahrain. There's an enormous amount of uh, equipment packed into a tiny space, and it had more systems, the hydraulic systems, the uh, center of gravity transfer systems. It had more of those than any other kind of aircraft. So it demands great precision. And it's, it's in a sense a more cerebral or intellectual airplane than others because of its complexity. But Concorde soon hit turbulence. Protest groups in the States fought hard to prevent it landing in New York. Finally, in 1977, after months of legal battles, British Airways and Air France won. Stewardess Charlie Hicks was on one of the first flights. The New Yorkers have a very sort of dry sense of humour, and I can remember we, we opened the door and the ground staff who were waiting for us said, Hi, what catcher? We've been waiting for years. <laughs> and they were really great fun, and everybody, the ground staff, all made such a fuss of us. And people seemed, we were expecting some sort of anti-feeling, but people seemed very happy to see us. Love is just a passing word. We had quite a lot of trouble with serving the meals at first because people were so excited to be flying at twice the speed of sound that they all wanted their photos taken on board to record this momentous event. Nothing like this had ever happened before and everybody wanted to be able to say I've flown on Concorde or just to see what it was like. And we carried a lot of famous people, film stars and the pop groups. And I was on one flight once uh, where we brought Superman back. We were all agog to see what he looked like. And everybody was fascinated because he didn't have anything to drink at all, just a glass of milk. <laughs> the New York service was a success, but other routes remained closed to Concorde and the planes often sat idle on the ground. The project had been paid for by the British taxpayer and now some wanted their own taste of the high life. At the Bell Inn, publican Jock McCauley and his regulars were the first people to charter Concord. I just seen it on the news. I think uh, we just opened the pub at six o'clock and himself here, Mr. Brian Calvert, was within the premises <laughs> and it had said on the news um, it was costing 10 pounds for every man, woman and child in the British Isles extra to 
whatever it had cost before. Um, and I walked her into the bar, informed Brian of this, and uh, I said, it's time we chartered this thing before it gets any dearer. <laughs> and uh, I think you said, well, if you can fill a Concorde, yeah. a hundred people, yeah. why don't you have a go? I had the pleasure of flying this extraordinary team from Aldworth. A lot of people came up to see what was going on. Grandmothers, brain surgeons, yeah. children, my mother-in-law didn't want me to go too far and all sorts of people came they up. They did, they all, yeah. they all wanted and they to go out and have a look, didn't they, mm -hmm. to see what this, made the thing work. That's right. We paid £100, £5 was for coaches and so much of that went for charity as well. You could just see, well I reckon, you could just see this, the curve of the earth and so sort of, that to me was fantastic, so, so I'll never see it again. We were the only people in the only part of the whole universe at that height, at that speed, and it was just wonderful. I think one of our friends, um, his teeth, false teeth dropped out. Yeah. Whether that was because it was going back to or not, I don't know. Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah! The Bell pub trip opened the floodgates for Concorde's lucrative charter business. Together, these flights keep one out of the seven planes busy. But all aeroplanes have a limited lifespan, and when time runs out for Concorde, supersonic travel itself will come to an end. Transport has always sought to decrease journey times, right from the days of stagecoaches and clipper sailing boats, steamships and aeroplanes. And for the last 30 years, aeroplanes haven't gone any faster, except for Concorde. Now, one of these days, uh, men of vision will, will uh, do a successor to the aeroplane. Um, sadly, I, I don't think the initiative will come from this country. It'll be a big international project. It'll involve America, Japan, and probably the French as well. On its current rate of usage, Concorde is likely to continue flying till about the end of the century, possibly just into the next century. But we are actually running tests on a British Airways aeroplane to measure in-flight stresses, hopefully using those results, we shall be able to keep the aeroplane flying until about the year 2010. Concorde est un avion, bien sûr, mais c'est le seul avion supersonique euh, au monde actuellement. Concorde, c'est aussi un oiseau et c'est une légende. Ce sera bientôt un mythe. C'est un avion qui a une beauté tout à fait extraordinaire. Et pour finir, je crois que c'est la plus grande aventure humaine de notre siècle. Only 20 Concordes were ever built. 14 are in airline service, two are used for spare parts, and four are in museums. Will we end up in, in the museum with it, Ricky? Um, I think <laughs> when the aircraft st stops flying, we will either probably end up in the museum, as John says, or maybe they'll, they'll throw us on a rubbish heap somewhere. Um, I think our futures have been, our past and our futures are pretty in inexorably linked with this aircraft. It's been a long time, it's over long 50 time. years between us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we shall be landing shortly in London. Please now return to your seats and ensure that your seatbelts are securely fastened. Thank you for choosing to fly Concorde, the world's fastest passenger aircraft. We look forward to welcoming on board again soon. Good night now and thank you. It's always so impressive. I mean, it's, um, it's nice to get home, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next week's vehicle in perpetual motion is the Milk Float, a victim of its own success. Next Friday, 8.30 on BBC Two.